right, so today we have Jonathan Cat with us. Uh, Jonathan got his uh, PhD from Cornell and then he was at the Institute for Advanced Studies and at, at UCLA before coming here. And yeah, when we invited him to talk about fast radio birth, which was around December, I think I counted, he had 22 papers on fast radio burst. But I checked last night and Ray had 24. So he <laughs> can be considered the world expert on fast radio burst and he'll tell us about it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, maybe just bibliography pattern. Okay, um, so I'm gonna try to bring you up to date on fast radio burst. There's been two actually rather interesting major data reports uh, publications recently, which is most of which what, what I'll talk about. But first, let me summarize the subject. Obviously, the title: is, What do we? What don't we? What do we know? And what don't we know? Okay. Most basic facts are they have large dispersion measures, which indicate that most of them have passed are in inter extragalactic distances, what we casually call cosmological distances, redshifts of order unity. A few are much have been identified with cloud galaxies are much closer. And this is simply inferred from the dispersion measure of the radio pulses, so something that's been known, was done for pulsars starting more than 50 years ago, and the plasma for the beginning a lot longer than that, that there's a frequency dependent propagation delay. Now, at least one of them has a near source <coughs> excess. This is how you measure column density in these funny units, parsecs per cubic centimeter, it's really per units, dimensions are per unit area, electron per unit area which says that if you try to measure the redshift simply from the dispersion measure plus cosmology, you may overestimate the distance because some of them have large near source excesses. Um, which tells you something, must tell you something about the region in which they're formed because this is not, as 900 parsecs per cubic centimeter, is not something you find in an ordinary line of sight in a galaxy. So it must be something about the near source environment and naturally you want to speculate about young supernova remnants. What does that translate to in terms of trauma? Well, um, three times 10 to the 21 per square centimeter. But these are the units people use for obvious reasons because typical interstellar densities are from one to 0.03 electrons per cubic centimeter and distances are in parsec. So it's convenient. Um, others appear to have these near source excesses, which are probably telling you something about the regions in which these are formed. So in other words, there's something interesting that happened that happened recently. So you think about young neutron stars, but not necessarily young neutron stars. The sky distribution in the sky is isotropic. They are not galactic, they're very distant objects, with one exception. There's some specific galactic identifications from a fairly nearby galaxy, a few megaparsecs away, to, well, redshift at a half. But one of them is identified as the galactic soft gamma repeater, which are often um, cold magnetars because they're believed to be produced by the dissipation of magnetostatic energy in a neutron star. The only neutron star with much greater magnetic field than a typical radio pulsar. And this one is identified with a globular cluster, which must tell you something about the stellar environment that forms it. What? We can still argue about. What do we have to explain? Okay, so if they radiate isotropically, which is very unlikely, but we don't know how they radiate, so you take the intensity you see, and if you have an estimate of the distance, which in some cases you have, you always have some estimate based on the dispersion measure interpreted as intergalactic. In some cases, you have a few cases are identified with objects of very whose distances are known quite accurately, like M81. Um, so you do four pi r squared, and that gives you about 10 to the 43 ergs per second if they radiate isotropically. Lots of reasons to believe that they are beamed, in which case the actual power produced may be orders of magnitude less, and typically for a couple of milliseconds. This is at frequencies typically L-band, which is 1200 to def definition of L-band is a little broader, but the typical radio astronomy receiver, receiver is 1200 to 1600 uh, megahertz, which is within it, the traditional L band. And the reason for that is because radio astronomers were born looking for the 21 centimeter line at 1420 megahertz. And so it's natural to build instruments that respond to that frequency. The Chime FRB measure, instrument uh, in Canada, which came online a couple of years ago, uh, and actually produced most of the fast radio bursts that are now in the catalog. 
um, actually works, was recently designed to measure 21 centimeter cosmological distances. And so it works 400 to 800 megahertz. Okay. So you can constrain the size of the source by, by the brevity of the pulse. And that gives you these truly spectacular brightness temperatures, actually bright as bright or brighter than any um, pulse radio pulsar. And that tells you it's the radiation is coherent. Um, some, no one knows at all, may only be a few, fast radio bursts repeat. I'll mostly be talking about repeaters today. Um, are they, do they all, are they two distinct classes? There's argument about that. There's probably reasonable evidence to indicate that they're in fact two distinct classes, but uh, that can't be proven. And it can, you can never prove that rigorously because you could say, oh, it repeats, but you got to look for a thousand years to see a repetition. Um, but there are other arguments that there are distinct classes. The spectra are complex. They are broad peaks. I think I'll show you some data on that of about one tenth of the frequency. So for example, if you're observing something at 1400 megahertz, there may be a peak between 1400 and 1450 and much less radiation at 1350 or 1500. And I'll show you in one or more view graphs, I forget why that's surprising or why that's telling you something. Okay. Temporal and spectral signatures. So this actually comes from the Canadian um, uh, Chime FRB experiment, which is somewhere just above, just north, north of the border in British Columbia. And what you see here actually are four bursts. Um, and you see energy, the, the color scale, which of course they never give you on these things, tells you the intense, spectral intensity. Frequency runs like that, 400 to 800 megahertz. Times runs like that. The width is about, of this, well, the tick marks are 25 millisecond intervals. So this is a typical non-repeating fast radio burst. You can see this, this is, and this is the time integral of the power. It trails, and that's because of scattering, multipath scattering. It's not intrinsic, as far as anyone knows. Um, and that's a much larger effect at low frequency, so you can see the thing swims out over there. The very sharp structure that you see over here, these sharp peaks, probably are instrumental. The point is it's a large telescope and the beam pattern is a complex function of frequency. So in any one direction, you can be in near the center of the beam or out in the side lobe. So these bumps are not physically significant. The, the white horizontal stripes are where there's radio frequency interference and that's just thrown out. However, if we look at this one, you can see that while those, that there's a broad frequency structure, this one radiates you probably can't see the scale, but a lot from sort of from 500 to 550 megahertz and nothing or nothing detectable, almost nothing detectable above 600 and or below 500. And that's telling you something interesting. By the way, these have been de-dispersed. So the interstellar, you fit to the amount of dispersion on the propagation path and take that out. It's a known function of frequency. Varies is the inverse square of frequency. And here's another one. And you can see as adult, it's the burst has two sharp peaks. And now this is one that's known to repeat. And the striking thing about the one that's known to repeat is something that's called the sad trombone effect, is that the frequency starts out or higher earlier and then sweeps down. There are a number of examples of this. This is just the previous picture I was able to find. And you might say, oh, that just means you've got the dispersion measure wrong because dispersion measure also predicts as the late lower frequencies come in later. But no, you don't because you can see these vertical stripes separated by narrow bands where there isn't any radiation. So the natural interpretation is that you, you have to search for dispersion measure in the data, is that you fit so that these vertical stripes are vertical, which means you have the right dispersion measure and the gap between them is also vertical. And then you look at it, you see you go from here down to here, down to here. And that, that sort of structure is seen only in repeaters and it's called the sad trombone effect, because it sounds like someone's reducing the free, sliding out the slide on the trombone, very high frequency trombone, but it's beside the point. And um, that's a characteristic marker of repeaters, which is interesting, because it means if you see one pulse, you may be able to say, hey, this is probably a repeater, let's look for it. Okay, so what can we infer? Well, yeah, promised you this graph. This actually was stolen from Jackson. Um, this is the radiation of an accelerated particle, charged particle. It's accelerated perpendicular to its velocity, but that's not a restriction significantly because 
radiation acceleration parallels of the velocity is well, very small for a relativistic particle and produces almost no radiation. This is when you look at something like this, you know, or calculate, you ordinarily say you're, I'm thinking about synchrotron radiation, but if you had anything else that would accelerate a particle, it would produce exactly the same spectrum because this is just the radiation of an accelerated particle. But about the only way to accelerate a charged particle, except for strong nuclear scattering, if it's a hadron, and we're talking about leptons here, so that isn't going to be the case, is by synchrotron radiation, by the J cross B force. Okay, so this is a generic spectrum. And the thing that's really strike you is that it's very, very smooth. Here you've got the frequency extending over five orders of magnitude, and the spectral density is a very slow function of frequency. Eventually, it has an exponential cutoff. So to get the frequency structure that we saw in the previous view graph or two view graphs back, something you can need more than this. This, is, of course, is the radiation of a point charge. Well, so the only way to get frequency structure that's sharper than this is to not just have a point charge, but have something the spatial Fourier transform has structure at the wavelength scale, spatial scales that give you the frequency structure, you just got to put in C and a couple of power of the gamma, at the frequency structure that you observe. So the fact that you see the frequency structure tells you what you already knew is that the particles are bunched, and it tells you more than that, it tells you the Fourier transform of their spatial distribution. I don't know what you do with that because plasma physics is really, really hard, but that information is there. Now, what do I do to go to the next slide? Should just be the, uh, the yeah, well, I'm doing, but nothing's happening. And going back doesn't work either. Not that I want to go back. But... Okay. Probably you were clicked out of the. Oh, yeah. Somehow. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Energetics. What I told you it's got to be coherent. Um, the fact that it's a brief event, typically a few milliseconds, tells you the structure is compact. Um, some people think it isn't actually the emission region that's compact, because if you have a narrow collimated beam, it can radiate somewhere else. Um, and we need a source of high energy density, not as high, not remotely by many orders of magnitude as a gamma ray burst or a supernova. But if you're going to produce, we had something like 10 to the 43 ergs per second very briefly, the energy density has got to be large, and that screams compact object at you. Well, now what exactly did I do wrong last time? I'm hitting the arrow and nothing's <clears throat> happening. So we click in here, let's see now. Okay, yeah. very yeah. good. Unanswered so question. Probably let's try it again. Okay, several unanswered questions. <coughs> First, what objects make fast radio bursts? Now, the coherent radiation is analogous, is something also observed in pulsars. This immediately screams at you magnetic neutron stars. I'm going to give you, if I still got some time, uh, I'm going to give you some arguments that they're not magnetic neutron stars. Next question. Well, are repeaters and non repeaters fundamentally different? And the way I'll describe that is, or the way I'll try to quantify that is, we know, we know how often at some threshold of observation, we, very, very, and any individual repeater repeats. And that actually varies with time. They have active episodes and inactive episodes. But suppose non-repeaters actually do repeat very infrequently. And there's a reason I can, can tell you um, why that, that you have to think that might be the case. So you can think of a frequency of repetition, which of course has to be defined by the sensitivity of the observing system. And is there, so the question, that, the way I'd restate question two, is there is a continuous distribution of frequency of repetition, like as a continuous distribution of the luminosity of stars, for example, or of the period periods of radio pulsars, or are they two distinct classes in which even the non-repeaters repeat, but too slowly to too rarely to be recognized as repeaters, but are fundamentally different than repeaters? I'm going to show you some data um, observation will have of order of ones per minute, and that obviously depends on the threshold. Not obviously, but is observed to depend on the threshold of detection. Okay, are the repeaters periodic? I think we have a lot of information that they're not, which is a real problem for the neutron star hypothesis. Um, and a chunk of today I will talk about that based on recent data. 
is a radiation collimated. That would certainly relax any energetic demands. Anything involving relativistic particles is likely to be collimated. There's no direct way of telling how collimated it might be. You have to use energetic arguments. I can't answer that, but I strongly suspect the answer is yes. What are their environments? And I'll be able to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and that's related to this excess dispersion measure, which is something that has a known redshift then the cosmologist will tell you how much dispersion measure there is on the line of sight. You take out a typically small galactic contribution, because we know something about the ionized gas in the galaxy, and the rest must be intrinsic to the source, which tells you something about the environment. And how do they radiate in these parameters? I think that will work. Okay, what objects make fast radio? Well, neutron stars are the obvious candidates, and just about everyone in the field, myself included, has often said that neutron stars, at least where the energy comes from, the people who think the energy, the actual radiation process occurs very far from the neutron star. Other hypothesis it occurs close to the magnetosphere, like in a radio pulsar. Well, the compact size is certainly consistent with their brevity. The light crossing time of a neutron star is about 30 microseconds. Pulsars show that um, magnetic neutron stars emit, can emit coherent high brightness radiation. They've got a lot of gravitational energy density. It's not clear how you'd use it here. They have, have many of them have a very high magnetostatic energy density. Um, you can imagine that, um, as in uh, soft gamma ray Peters, this is somehow tapped by magnetic reconnection. Some neutron stars have very high rotational energy density. Well, of course, that's what powers pulsars, but very but you draw on it very slowly. The spin down is slow. And association with a new with the young supernova may explain near source dispersion measure. I told you that was a recent discovery. Here's the dispersion measure was nine the excess, not counting the cosmological, that's reasonably understood. Uh, dispersion measure was quite large, and that could be explained by a by immersion in a young supernova remnant or perhaps a, a comparatively dense accretion flow. Okay, but there are problems with the neutron star hypothesis. The first and most obvious, the galaxy is about 100 million neutron stars, which is about every conceivable parameter. Some are young, no more than a few hundred years. Some are strongly magnetized, some aren't. Some are fast rotating, some aren't. Yet almost one of them is a source of fast radio bursts. So that, in fact, if you look at the map of the fast radio burst sky, it's isotropic except for this one extremely bright one that's identified with the soft gamma repeater in the galactic plane. And you know, if you look at a map of the sky in just about anything, no, not high energy neutrinos, but a great many other astronomical things, the first thing that strikes you is the galactic plane. And the reason is very simple, which is that look at the distribution of mass in the universe, weighted by one over r squared, it's concentrated in the galactic plane because of that weighting, because we're in the galaxy, we're in a special location. And so anything that is correlated with mass should concentrate in the galactic plane. Fast radio bursts don't. So that tells you that they're not made by some common galactic object. And you say common, well, we got 100 million neutron stars. So it could be a fairly small subset of that and you still expect to have some in the galactic plane. And with this one exception, which people argue about, argue about whether you should call it a fast radio burst, with that one exception, none of these 100 million neutron stars make fast radio bursts because they are so much closer than anything extragalactic, even M81, they're of order a thousand times closer than that. You'd expect them to be a million times brighter and actually many billion times brighter if you compare to something at a redshift of one half or one, where, which is a typical fast radio burst distance. You'd really ex expect that fast radio bursts should concentrate in the galactic plane. And they don't. And the fact that they don't tells you they are produced by an object that is so rare that you don't find any, that there is zero of them in the galaxy. Yes? It's not very nearby. If you have an intrinsic dispersion, you're talking about a lot of uh, nearby population at the very, that some sort of dispersion measure that mimics. Well, first, well, first they're isotropic on the sky. Right, so nearby, like bright stars or millisecond. Okay, bright stars are not isotropic. Well, very bright stars within 100 parsecs are isotropic yeah. on the star, right. sky, but they clearly don't produce fast radio bursts. One thing, how would you ever get dispersion measure that's a, that corresponds to a redshift of one? In terms of the logic of the argument, very nearby, for example, the neutrinos 
because it's the all over the place, maybe yeah. Yeah, it's the art, yeah, sure. Right. You know what I mean? Just double side of it. Yes. Right. The problem, yeah, okay, no. If the argument is strictly based on isotropy, you're absolutely right. And we went through this with gamma ray bursts a few decades right. ago. Okay. Um, the problem is there's no credible nearby source, and when there are accurate identifications, they are not identified with bright stars. The accurate identifications are with galaxies at redshifts of tenths to one. Except for this. Okay. So, there's, and now there was this great big outburst, and I can't remember what year it was, of that soft gamma repeater. I, mean, I think it was the strongest gamma repeater outburst ever observed. And it's not a metafast radio burst, which tells you there's some problem in connecting them with soft gamma repeaters. Now, I have a, there's a solution to that problem, but maybe you uh, probably won't have time for it. Uh, maybe I will. Okay, one of them is identified in the globular cluster in M81. Uh, oh, can I yes. ask a question? Uh, so when you say, the, so there was a soft gamma repeater that did not emit a fast radio burst. Right. Uh, do we, can we tell that for sure given the duty cycle of the- We can tell that for sure because it turned out it was in the side lobe of a radio telescope making an irrelevant observation. And you know what the side lobe brightness, I mean, sensitivity is, it's down by about 50 decibels. And at that distance, you'd expect 11 orders of magnitude, 110 decibels brighter than one in cosmological distance. So it tells you at 60 decibels, or maybe stretch at 50 decibels, fainter, intrinsic, intrinsically less luminous, five or six orders of magnitude. Okay. Um, okay. It's possible the more distant ones, remember this one's only three and a half megaparsecs away, might be in globular clusters. We don't know because when, even when you identify with galaxies, if the galaxy is at a redshift of 0.5, you can't tell whether something's, you can tell it's identified with the galaxy, you can't tell whether it's in a globular cluster. M81, you definitely can. Globular clusters suggest closed binaries, maybe even neutron star white dwarf magnetic interaction. Suggest. There's a lot of closed binaries in globular clusters, a lot of binary neutron stars in globular clusters, so maybe, and I wrote a paper on that. That doesn't mean I believe it. Um, neutron stars radiate. Okay, so here's a real problem with that hypothesis. They're expected to be periodic, but fast radio bursts aren't. There's no evidence for periodicity, and a chunk of this talk, as well as a chunk of the revised paper that I'm about to send to uh, archive, is about tightening up the argument that fa fast radio bursts are not periodic. No one had ever seen, repeating means obviously, no one had ever seen evidence of periodicity, but now the evidence against that is really quite strong. One plane of these periodicity, right? There are planes, right? There's no credible plane. No credible plane. Okay. Yeah, right. Um, there's one where, yes, they saw five sub pulses, two tenths of a millisecond, no, it was 200 milliseconds apart, and they don't look periodic to me doesn't pass the eyeball test. I don't have that data in here. So, so I, find, I say no credible. Okay. You can take almost any red noise process. If you only see less than 10 cycles, it can mimic periodicity really easily. No, I yeah. thought that's what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. That. Oh, that's I I, I, he's exactly right. That's exactly what I'm saying, yeah. although he yeah. said it better no, than I, I did. Yeah, no. and he said it much better than I did. Okay. Um, and there's even a hypothesis that the fast radio burst is produced in a supernova run and it beam launched by a rotating neutron star and so it could be produced very far away, many light seconds away, but it's got to be collimated to get a narrow burst and to do that it's still going to have the periodicity of the underlying neutron star even though it's produced very far from it. Okay, so let's see if they're periodic, which is probably all of this, what are these, this presentation that we're going to be able to get through today. Okay, evidence against it. Well, the best studied repeating FRB has got that name, which is just the year, month, and day of first discovery. And there's a recent paper, well, it's, you know, so it's now five months old, I guess, not that recent. Um, and it's actually now out in astrophysical um, We reported 1,652 bursts from this one object. Okay. And I will show you the analysis of that. But they did. If they took a periodogram, oh, I should say 652 bursts over about two months. In other words, they were using FAST, the 500, giant 500 meter telescope, um, and it, they observed it most days over those two months. And on most of those 
days, they observed for an hour, typically it was for an hour, sometimes two hours, a couple of cases, four or five hours. And they observed in most of those days, well, you can sort of do the arithmetic, 50 to 100 bursts. Some days there were few, some days there was only one, and some days they didn't see anything. Um, and with those, with those data, you well, I'll show you what you do with those data later. What they did is they simply took a periodogram of the whole thing. Well, the problem with that is this is a frequency derivative, and everyone, your neutron stars spin down. Then you dephase the beginning, the bursts at the beginning from the bursts at the end, or the periodicity of the beginning with the periodicity at the end. And it doesn't take much time derivative of the frequency. You have no idea what the frequency would be. It could be anything from the makeup frequency of a neutron star, which is about a kilohertz, down to anything. Um, if the frequency, if the spin down rate is typical of pulsars, it'll completely defay, or of soft camera repeaters, it'll completely defase the periodicity from the beginning of those two months to the end of those two months. So doing a periodogram of the whole thing doesn't work, by which I mean you can do it, but it won't find the periodicity if it's there, if there's any slight time dependence of the period. This is not true of a Fourier transform, but you can't do a Fourier transform of this because the data are very intermittent. So you do what's called periodogram of the times of the individual bursts. Okay, individual bursts are typically in an active period separated by about a minute, and then people make graphs, I can be guilty of it too, of the um, inter burst intervals. And typically, that will, of course, this depends on how sensitive the telescope is, uh, typically about a minute, which is certainly inconsistent with a very long period rotational modulation. You can't have them a minute apart if there's a period of 160 days. Now, oh, it is modulated with 160 days. In other words, out of the 160 days, there's about more than half, 100 days in which you've never no one sees any bursts, and all the others is in the, in the, in the intermediate 60-day period. And that is also not understood. I'll tell you what I think it might be later. But I can't imagine a neutron star could rotate that slowly. You kick it with your toe. I'm exaggerating. If you put in a number, you'll see. You kick it with your toe, it'll go faster than once per 160 days. You've got a small moment of inertia. Not that, not literally with your toe. You really wouldn't want to anyway. Yes? So, so how does this sound implausible for a neutron star rotation? But what, what about if it was a binary system? They can have a wider range. Yes, and the problem, people have put out hypotheses of how this could be a binary system. The problem, and so there's this story is, oh, well, so it's immersed in a wind, and if you're going, on the, and the wind is opaque to radio waves, the problem is that you said that, that at lower frequency, where the opacity is higher, you see the, the uptime at 160 days is longer than at higher frequency. While if it's a wind that's opaque in radio, we'd expect the opposite. And that may actually be true, but I'm talking about the, rota the issue of rotation. So what that is, yeah, is, is a completely separate issue. And there are problems with the binary hypothesis, but it should be considered serious. OK, so let's look at evidence against periodicity. First, two different kinds of periodicity you can think of. Exact periodicity. In other words, are bursts separated by integer multiples of a stable period. Now, the timing is precise and accurate, typically to a tenth of a millisecond. At least that's how they publish it. The intrinsic clocks are much better than that. Um, and this, of course, is, works for RRATs. RRATs are radio pulsars, most of whose pulses are missing. So you have a large number, and I'm not close enough to tell you whether that's tens or thousands. You have a lot, or even hundreds of thousands, a large number of pulses that are missing, and then you get a pulse. And then you get sometime later another one. And those intervals turn out to be integer multiples of an underlying period. Now, that's exact periodicity, even though most of the pulses are missing. They're called RRATs, and they're considered a special case of pulsars. Most of the pulses are just the term they use is null. They're not detectable, they're not detected. OK, now, this paper, which I actually did the analysis then and forgot about it and stumbled on it when I was doing this later thing, stumbled on my files. These people reported, they reported about 15 or something bursts, 10 to 20 bursts, but five of them within 93 seconds. And the nice thing about that is it makes period drift, period derivatives, insignificant because the period's not going to change very much in 93 seconds. 
So how do we tell if these five bursts, I mean, there are four independent intervals between bursts, are consistent with a period? Well, I remember sitting there and doing the Diophantine arithmetic, you know, looking for a, an interval that was an integer fraction of each of these four independent intervals and being convincing myself that there weren't any. But it's hard to write that up. So I didn't. Okay, so I did a more systematic approach more recently. No, excuse me, I actually did it then. Okay. I said, suppose you have a period and you took, you know, 10 to the 7 periods. Computers, when they're not making presentations, are very useful devices. Um, of a plausible range. This is, in fact, faster than the neutron star is going to spin. And this, well, oh, I took that down. So they're 10 to the, this is 10 to the 7 times that. So I took that range. And I said, suppose that these intervals are integer multiples of a possible 10 to the 7 possible periods, that is, once per 1.2 hours, 2 per 1.2 hours, also up to 10 to the 7 per 1.2 hours, which is 0.4 milliseconds. And then what is the deviation in terms of the period of these four independent intervals? And how are they distributed? Well, so occasionally your period is going to be approximately, it's going to become close. It's going to fit these four in the, in, independent intervals accidentally, not because there's a real underlying periodicity, because you could draw those four intervals or those five burst times out of a random number generator. And some period they'll fit reasonably well. Okay. So how many occurrences had the root mean square deviation of the, of the per, strict periodicity from the actual times? This is in units of the period or in fractions of the period of in these various values from zero to 0 0.1, you, you carry it out higher. And of course, if there's a real periodicity, when you hit the right period, you'll get zero aside from measurement error and round off. This is a distribution you find, a number of occurrences from one to a thousand, and you know, it keeps on going up as cube, in fact. Um, and there's nothing that, there, there's no period that fits to the accuracy. Which, which uh, concept is this? 121102. So one, it's not an FRB, but a... It's a fast radio burst. It's, it everything I'm talking about today is a fast radio burst. Because, okay, I think yeah. you said there This is the most now. famous and original repeating fast radio burst. Okay, I and the one so. for which there are the most data. Okay. So uh, this is, in fact, evidence of more than my doing Diophantine arithmetic on the margins of the Xerox copy of the paper is um, evidence that the, uh, those, those five bursts are not related by a, con by a, by a, by a constant exact period. And um, in night, oh, since they're only night, for the first and the last only 93 seconds apart, period derivatives are not likely to be significant. Okay, periodograms. <laughs> so this is a periodogram. You could weight it by the strength of the events. I didn't, I don't think people usually do. And so it looks like a Fourier transform, except it's a Fourier transform of a series of delta functions at times Tn. Okay, so this is cosine, sine, and the amplitude is, of course, root mean square. That's called the periodogram amplitude, an ancient method. And the point is, you know, if you have millisecond time resolution data over a year, you've got 10 to the 10 data points, which I guess these days you could do in with an FFT, but Periodograms go back at least a century. But of course, your data is very intermittent, which is the sort of thing it was, into, it was meant for. You discover one event at one point, another event, you know, minutes later, and so on and so forth. So you may have a large number of events in this data set, you have over a thousand, but the number of discrete time intervals of observation is 10 to the 10 or something like that. Okay, periodograms don't work if phase drift is significant, unlike fast Fourier transforms, which do. So if you have an inter data over an interval t, the phase drift from the center of the interval to its ends is that, and the reason the eight comes from is because we're talking from the center, so it's really t over two squared, and, so that's, and that's the time derivative of the frequency. For rotating neutron star with spin down age a, this is sort of elementary pulsar theory, the um, time derivative is the frequency divided by twice the spin down age. Um, this applies to pulsars that are very old. They're spinning very slowly compared to what they were born with, which may or may not be the case. You can simply define the spin down age by this equation. 
Okay. Um, this might be as large for a fast spinning, you can imagine pulsar spinning with a millisecond period, and age, we're talking here 10 years because this fast radio burst has been observed for the last nine years or so. This could be as large as, well, that. That's, I'll show you one or two other numbers. That's a fast spin down rate. And that's, um, so that's what you have to deal with. The useful time you plug into here, replacing omega dot, and basically you plug into this equation using this. This tells you how long a time interval is useful. Delta phi, well, if delta phi is a phase drift is more than about pi radians, you're not going to see a periodicity. Um, of course, you don't know what A and omega are, but A might be quite short, the, the observed age of the object, about a decade. And omega, well, could be as large as, 10, as 2 pi times 10 to the 3. Neutron stars can spin with a millisecond period. And that means that the, well, that the useful length of data is, could be very short. In other words, and in the answer, when you plug in the numbers, is, is sort of order an hour, which is telling you that if you take a that if you take a periodogram of five months, excuse me, two months of data, which is what the people who published the paper did, it's very likely that any periodic signal was washed out if there was a periodic signal there. And there are two such papers, one on this recently, one on this fast radio burst, there's a number you don't want to remember, and one on another, whose number I'm not even going to bother you with. Um, each case between one and two, nearly 2,000 bursts, and both of these authors, authors of groups of dozens of people, um, took periodograms as a whole time series, didn't find any periodicity, but as I said, two months is just ridiculous, because if you plug this in for plausible values of A and omega, the time, the, you, you, you can't usefully use data that's more than a quarter an hour more. In other words, there could be a periodicity there, and you're just not seeing it because it the phase decorrelates over the data span. Okay, so here are these two recent observations, this one and this other one, um, and they didn't find anything, but they won't find any periodicity if the time derivative of the angular frequency is greater than that. Do that, you think of that as a big number? Well, soft gamma repeaters typically have 10 to the minus 11. Many pulsars have smaller values, but those are old pulsars that you don't think of as likely to be energetic events, and there are lots of them in our galaxy, and we don't have fast radio bursts in our galaxy. So ordinary old pulsars are not a plausible hypothesis. And um, fast radio bursts may involve more extreme parameters. For example, these STRs are known because they're in supernova runs to be a few thousand years old. Um, the fast radio bursts could be as young as a decade or less, depending on how long a particular one's been observed, and they might very well have larger frequency and larger omega dot. So taking these both data runs ran about two months, doing a periodogram of two months of data is not likely, to, is not informative. It won't find anything, but that doesn't tell you anything. So what's the solution? Well, the observations are individual sessions, typically an hour long, because the telescope they're using is a transit instrument like Arecibo. It can't point a 500 meter dish, it just sits in a valley. But you can move the feed, so the, bird, so the object transits through the meridian, and it can stay in the field of view for a few hours. Five hours sometimes, and most of these data runs are an hour. It depends, of course, on the um, uh, declination and I don't remember what the definition of these things is, but a few hours is typically how long things stay in the field of view if they're in the field of view at all. So the solution is you compute, it's really obvious, you compute the periodogram of each separate observing session. Well, typically they're an hour long, but some of them have been as long as five hours. And now you get very little dephasing if omega dot is that large, simply because things came in as t squared and now t is an hour, not two months. So this is what you do. Now, in, for extreme cases, the, um, you could have omega dot, if you have a really, really fast, very rapidly slow spinning on neutron star, omega dot could be larger than that. This is meant to be an absolute value, um, but only for the most extreme parameters. So if you simply look at an hour of data, which is a natural way it blocks it come in, um, you, can, you, you suddenly become insensitive to dephasing. That's what I've been doing the last couple of weeks. Okay, so what do I actually have here? Well, of their 
39 observing sessions with the so fast radio birds, 70, I mean, impose an arbitrary condition. I, just, I wouldn't look at it unless they have um, at least 50 births. So we get good, we get good statistics. That actually still leaves 78% of the births. So, and there's 17 such observing sessions whose lengths range from, lengths are typically an hour, and the number of births ranges from 50 to, I think one of them is 122. So the statistics aren't too bad. Okay, so you do the Fourier transform, you look at 3.6 million possible frequencies from, or periods from a millisecond to an hour, and that's just the ratio of those times. And so the periodogram has 3.6 million elements. And now you look at their amplitude and the distribution of their amplitudes. And this is pretty close to a Gaussian, which is what you'd get if the bursts occur randomly in a Poissonian process. It's not quite a Gaussian, and that's probably a consequence of the fact that the rate of the mean rate of burst varies over time. You know, there were sessions where I didn't observe any, and so one session at 50, and another has to, I didn't look at the one we didn't have any, of course. One session at 50, another at 122, and the others are scattered in between. So it's not really Gaussian. And even within a session, the intervals aren't they aren't spaced in a purely Poissonian way. But that doesn't, shouldn't really bother you. It's remarkably close to a gas. What you're really interested in is did there one element of the periodogram stand out? Did it have the right period? Of a, did it detect the period of something that was really periodic? So you'll say, well, I'm cheating you because maybe there is such a thing and way off over here, the amplitude is five or 10 or something. Well, you search the data and no, the largest one is 1.71 and that's this one. Except that may actually be two, so it may actually be, actually may actually be sort of over here, but it's 1.71. It's consistent with this distribution, and it tells you there's no credible evidence for periodicity. And you also look at the, I can't show you the data because 17 curves would be too much, and, um, at the data for each of these individual 17 sessions, and there's no evidence for periodicity in any of them. But the Van Els point is still valid for pulsar like. Periodicities, not for really long orbital kind of. Well, things. that's right. We're looking at periods up to an hour. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And we know about the 160 day period. That's there. That's real. No doubt about it. No, we're looking for periods up to an hour that would be associated with a rotating neutron star. Okay, so are there alternatives? And obviously, I think I should stop at the scheduled time, even though I didn't stop. Um, Okay, well, yes. I mean, my favorite alternative is, is an accretion funnel. That is this inner part of an accretion disk around the black hole. We know that in active galactic nuclei, they make jets of collimated relativistic particles. We also know that fast radio bursts are not produced by active galactic nuclei because we have identifications and they're not with AGMs. They're with galaxies, with outer parts of galaxies, or for regulars that don't have AGMs and so on. How about intermediate black mass black holes? Well, that actually offers a nice explanation of long period modulation, is that if you have this disk around the black hole, the disk can, if there's a binary companion, which is plausible, and stars who may be captured by these things in, you know, in the center of the galaxy, not necessarily in the center of the galaxy, one of them is in the modular cluster, stars are captured by these things, then you've got a binary and the disk can precess which is well known and abundantly demonstrated in this funny object and in this X-ray source. Um, so this actually provides a very natural explanation of the long period modulation, which is observed in two fast radio bursts, 100 days, you know, 16 days. Um, now, what we know about the jets of this one is that they're, these are jets, but they're thermal plasma, is that their direction jitters and so the jitter of the disk axis could explain active and inactive periods and the low various duty factors and so on. Would explain the rarity of fast radio bursts versus the 10 to the eight neutron stars in our galaxy alone, because intermediate black holes, intermediate mass black holes are not very common. We don't know if there are any in our galaxy. We know there's a big one at the center of the galaxy. There's been speculation about intermediate black mass black holes and globular clusters, but we actually, none has actually ever been identified anywhere. Okay, it's been suggested for one of those clusters. Well, it's 10 o'clock and you probably want me to stop. So unless I have something really compelling on the next. Okay. Um,
this is an important question to ask. But since it's 10 o'clock, I probably should stop oh. now. Yeah. Do you think then also we stop now and pick, have them continue in a later meeting or something? We could. I, I find this very. Do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hate to. You're rushing through these in five minutes. Yeah. Now that that's not useful for. Well, well especially right. since we've got Vicky coming too. So you know, yeah, Vicky Caspi's going to be doing a talk on the yeah, observations of this. So having him do this again would be great. Yeah, I, I'd like to hear more. Okay. okay. Put so me on the calendar. Okay. And I'd be happy to. <clears throat> and they should have a revised. Well, probably won't be till Monday. Revised version of my paper on archives. The also, original paper only had a little fraction of this. So if we look on Monday, it will be up to 25 RV papers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I don't know how you count them. Are they yeah. repeating? Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I have a look for periods. I, you know, I can't guarantee, you know, I should get it in this afternoon. And, you know, okay. you know um, it might be Tuesday or something. Who knows? So are there any questions? Maybe we can ask the audience on Zoom if they have one quick question that they want to get in. You can unmute yourself and, and speak up if there's any questions for Jonathan. Any questions from you? I guess, so I'm trying to sort of coming at this from the big picture of it. So there's all this new FRB data coming in and there are now all these different models trying to explain it. So is there sort of anything you feel like is going to come in the near future with all this new data that's going to really, you know, definitively point to any mechanism? Okay, well, if someone found a period that would conclusive, you know, a reasonably short period, not the 100 day period, that would say this is a rotating neutron star. Mm -hmm. You found a period of a tenth of a millisecond or a tenth of a millisecond or 10 seconds or 100 seconds. Um, well, in the one to the data I showed you, there isn't one. There's another data set I mentioned with a different fast radio burst with 1800 bursts and some odd bursts. And I've asked these people for their data and they haven't sent it. So I will do the same analysis when those data are published or when they send, are kind enough to send them to me, but I don't have them. Um, so, you know, maybe you'll find a periodicity there. Um, uh, so that's, you know, that's an obvious thing to look for. Um, I have a hypothesis that the non-repeaters are sort of mini soft gamma repeaters, but not with the 10 to the 14 or 15 gauss of the, <coughs> of the soft gamma repeaters that we have. And the reason is when you have a great big soft gamma repeater outburst, like the one that didn't produce a fast radio burst, it fills the space around the neutron star with equilibrium pair plasma, really thermal equilibrium and temperature of a couple of MeV. Well, this, of course, is opaque to everything, you know, the gamma rays, and ultimately explodes as a soft gamma repeater when a photosphere forms. And it's not gonna, you, you can't accelerate non-thermal particles and you're not gonna get radio radiation out of this. But, to, but what's, interesting about so, what's interesting about soft gamma repeaters is that they're outliers. If you look at a soft gamma repeater, it has lots of little outbursts. Those are, they're also called anonymous alum, Anomalous X ray pulses, AXP. That's their quiescent phase. And then you have these giant outbursts. And there's not a power law distribution of frequency connecting them, which is unusual in astrophysics. I wrote a paper about that too, which is in monthly notes, within the last year. And that I think is out in monthly notices, and of course it's an archive. But you the key word to look for is outliers in the title. And so soft gamma repeaters are rather unusual in astronomy in that they have. These two different kinds of events, the little ones and the big ones, and the big ones are outliers in terms of the distribution of little ones. They're not consistent with an extrapolation. Well, that could explain these very, these apparent non repeaters. Suppose they have a big event, who knows, once every thousand years, once every million years, um, but there's no, but they don't have more frequent power law distribution of yet smaller events, so they haven't been detected as small outbursts. Now, why do they have to be mini? Because if you take something like the group software repeaters in the galaxy, with fields of 10 to the 14 or 15 gauss, when they erupt, everything's opaque thermal plasma. But if you cut the field down by a few orders of magnitude, and yet have an analogous eruption, the order of energy is down by, the amount of energy is down by twice that many orders of magnitude, it's not energetic enough to produce an equilibrium pair plasma. 
And so you have a low density environment, which like an ordinary pulsar could accelerate particles and conceivably, well, it's speculation, produce fast radio motion. Very speculative. But on the other hand, if you got a better idea, let us know. <laughs> So, actually, several questions go. Thank you, Alfred. But these relatively narrow spectral features, those are tough. And you, you mentioned, you also mentioned, okay, so first of all, the narrow narrow spectral features. If you have an intermediate acid black hole with a jet, whatever, how do you explain those narrow spectral features? Well, the magic words are plasma physics. <laughs> and the next two magic words are is hard. Uh, no one has ever explained, for example, why radio pulsars emit pulsars. Somehow charges bunch because they're coherent, because you've got this ridiculous yeah, brightness. Yeah, so coherence may be okay. an element. So, the yeah. spectral, so what the spectral distribution does tell you is the Fourier transform of the spatial distribution of the charge density. So the charge density is plumb. Okay, and then the spectrum you get is the product of the spatial distribution of, of the of the, the Fourier transform of the spatial distribution of the charge density times the Fourier transform of the radiation produced by a delta function, a single charge. Well, that I showed you okay. the figure from Jackson. That's very, very broad. Right. But you multiply that by the spatial distribution that plasma physics produced in the charge density, which we don't understand at all, but can have features that are much narrower than Jackson gives you for a point, because the spectral distribution of the delta function is flat. Um, and that's the explanation that it's in the plasma physics. Now, as a plasma physics is too hard. Okay, so one other, so there's just a little follow up to this. So we saw the spectral feature in the shining data. Is that, or are there redshifts or, or dispersion measures for such features that indicate, like I've wondered, the shining data is lower frequency. Are they somehow? larger dispersion measure events than the early discoveries of higher frequency telescopes, like, are they more redshifted? So um, is there, you know, could there be a characteristic energy? Scale? Not obviously. Um, that I do not, I'm not aware that the chime identifications are in fact closer than the L-band and you know, the Parks identification. I'm thinking, I'm thinking maybe further because or you know, further, well, it's harder to yeah. detect Low, further things at low frequency simply because the dispersion right. measures broadening right. and but the multi path broadening is larger. Characteristic uh, energy scale or frequency that one might expect is it's showing up, not, especially not, it's, like this this narrow band feature, okay. right? It's not yeah, it's not obvious. It's true that the lower frequency you are, the harder it is to detect things with high dispersion measure and high um, okay. scattering. But I don't think that's really a determining factor. And I haven't seen a system, but maybe I just haven't paid attention right. to a systematic kind of comparison of the distances of, of the chime events detected at 400 megahertz and the um, L band events detected by a lot of telescopes. And in a few cases, their detections up to 8 gigahertz. Right, right. Any last questions? Love this thing. Okay, thank you.